Uh, welcome everybody to session four of Chandra Data Science. Uh, this session will feature six speakers. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a great lineup for you today, this afternoon. I'd like to start by introducing the first speaker. Our first speaker is Alicia Rouco Escorial from Northwestern University and is going to talk to us about the latest systematic X-ray study for short gamma ray burst afterglows at late times and implications in progenitor rates. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, share. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Rodolfo. So, okay, thank you, uh, Rodolfo, and everyone, and the organizers for having me today here. I'm Alicia Rocco Escorial, and I'm a postdoc at Sierra, Northwestern University, and I'm working in the group of Professor Wenfei Fong. And today, as uh, Rodolfo said, I'm going to talk about uh, work that we have been doing these last months about the systematic study of late time short ERB after in X-rays. And I will mention also some implications on progenitor rates. And I also want to thank uh, my collaborators, are, are most of them in this slide. But if I'm forgetting someone, sorry about that. I will be sure that you are uh, in the next uh, uh, talk. <laughs> Uh, let's start a little bit with an introduction of what a gamma ray burst is. Uh, so gamma ray bursts or ERBs are rapid, highly energetic explosions uh, that release gamma ray radiation and occur at cosmological distances with an isotropic distribution on the sky. And traditionally, all these events have been classified in two big groups, uh, short and long ERBs. So for short ERBs, they last in general less than two seconds. Uh, they are less energetic than non GRBs and they appear to or they occur on lower density environments since they show uh, larger offsets from their host galaxies. And since the detections, uh, the detection of 17A, uh, this gravitational wave event together with a short GRB, we now know that some of these uh, short GRBs have as a progenitors double neutron star mergers. On the other hand, we have long GRBs that last more than two seconds. They are more energetic. They appear in higher density environments. And we know that they are related to the death of massive stars. So for this talk, I will focus on this group, so GRBs, and uh, for the future, we have the long GRBs. So what is important, why these short GRBs are so cool and important is, well, uh, short GRBs, uh, they can study can be studied from the prompt emission uh, and also from uh, for her, their uh, afterglows uh, from gamma rays to radio. I'm showing here some of the uh, facilities that we use, but there there is a myriad of them, and we have a lot of them. So, uh, so GRBs uh, go from I'll say gamma rays to the radio, and this information uh, that we get from the afterglow, we can use it for get some information about the environment uh, where these explosions are happening, um, from the energetics of the proper uh, explosion. And in particular, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the X-rays. And uh, as all of us know, we have these three big facilities that they are amazing, Swift, XMN, Newton, and for sure, uh, Chandra, that's why we are here. Um, so let's go a little bit deep, deep in X-rays. So why should you be in X-rays? Well, if we have a neutron star, neutron star merger, and we detect the uh, short GRB right after the explosion. Uh, the central engine uh, launches a collimated, uh, highly collimated uh, relativistic outflow that we call JET. And uh, this JET interacts with the medium in time. And therefore, also the, the bulk uh, Lorentz factor of uh, this JET uh, evolves in time. Once the Lorentz factor equals uh, the inverse of the opening angle. Uh, the jet opening angle, uh, the inverse of this, uh, sorry, jet opening angle, uh, we see a jet break. Uh, what is a, how this is translated in our data? Well, we have two scenarios. The first is, is a scenario is that we, if we have our light cure and we plot like flag, uh, flags and time, 
there is suddenly a temporal stepping in the slope of the light curve. And this stepping is what we call the time of the jet break. And having uh, these, jet, these times uh, well defined, we can uh, get values of the jet opening angles. The other scenario is when we don't detect any jet break, but don't worry, we can still uh, uh, have some uh, lower limits uh, uh, in, on the opening angle of the jet. And together, if we glue together all this information for short GRBs, we can get a distribution for these uh, detections and uh, lower limits for uh, opening angles. So this is our aim to build a distribution for these angles. And for, from these angles, we can infer also the distribution of the beaming correction factor that at the same time we can use for obtaining the true rate event distribution. Uh, and with this to event uh, this, uh, mean, we will compare the values uh, with the neutron star neutron star merger rates that are derived from LIGO and from uh, for our galactic environment. So let's go and talk a little bit more about our uh, X-ray sample. So from uh, the all the GRBs that uh, have been detected so far, we are going to focus on short GRBs that have been detected by Swift Pad between 2005 and 2020. Uh, we also uh, have in the account the event 050709 that was detected by Hetty. And we also have into account those short GRBs with identify or potential tail emission. So we found 120 short GRBs. And um, from these 120, uh, 106 have been followed by Swift XRT uh, beyond one day uh, from the trigger. So what we did is uh, we look at the archives from XMEM and Chandra, and we found all the data or observations that were possible for these uh, uh, events. And we had five short GRBs, uh, have, uh, we found that five short GRBs have late time XMEM observations, 18 short GRBs have late time with Chandra observations, and seven of them uh, have uh, both XMEM and Chandra. Once we had all this data, we reprocess and uh, analyze in a systematic way all these uh, observations, and we uh, perform also a spectral analysis. We obtain the anasor fluxes, and we uh, link together like this uh, late time information with early time inform information from Swift to build up our uh, light curves. Next step is to see what we can do with these light curves. And for that, we run a Markov uh, chain Monte Carlo simulations uh, to explore the fitting parameters space uh, of the light curves and to obtain the best uh, fit parameters or variation estimates uh, for the models. So we set up a 15,000 Markov chain uh, from which we discard uh, the initial half as uh, periods of burning and we uh, fit three models. The first model is the single power law, as you can see here, um, is defined by an amplitude and a single decay index. We have also a, bro a broken power law that is defined by the amplitude, the uh, two different segments with different uh, decay indices, and one time for a break. Mm -hmm. And I want to underline that in all in the case, on this case on the left, if we have the flux and the time, is defined as a, the time of the jet break, uh, in the other, uh, on the other hand, uh, on the left, on the right, sorry, we have some kind of uh, late time emission. And how we also can define these uh, times of the breaks is like we use this smooth parameter uh, that we uh, get as a constant. Uh, for triple power law, uh, we have three segments. Uh, we have two different uh, time for breaks. We have three different segments with three different decay indices. And we have two smooth, uh, smooth uh, parameters that we also uh, establish as a constant. Uh, so we have like an initial decay, a plateau uh, behavior, and a uh, last decay for the third segment. So once we have our three models run for also the, the all the SOR GRBs, we also have to define the likelihood uh, function. And for that, we also consider both detections and upper limits. So our likelihood function has two parts, one that has in the Gaussian, Gaussian error function and an error function. And how this works is, is that if we have a detection, 
this part will be canceled and all detections will be count uh, on the Gaussian error function. Whereas if we have an upper limit, uh, this part of the likelihood function will be canceled and the upper limits will be defined by the error function. We also have in token the uncertainties. So if we have detections, we get uh, one sigma uncertainties from those detections. And uh, for the case of upper limits, since upper, since upper limits don't have errors, but anyway, we get the uh, we get as the three sigma upper limits, and the uncertainty will be the one sigma upper limit. And we also have in token the residuals. So these residuals would be the difference between our data and the model. And last but not least, we also have to uh, determine which is our best fit model. And for that, we use a statistical F test uh, that will discriminate towards the best fit model between the three of them. So here I'm showing, showing, showing you some of the fitted light curves and examples. In the y axis, you have flux, and the x axis, you have time. Uh, we have the sample for tip, uh, single power law for 18 or for 18A. This or GRB was very cool and nice also because I work on that. But uh, this, uh, this short GRB is one of the short GRBs that have been detected till very late times. This last standard observation was up to 39 days. And as you can see here, there is not a time, uh, the time for the break. So we can infer a lower limit for the opening uh, angle of the jet. In the case of 20 or 2005-22A, uh, we also see that what is the importance of the late time inf information from Chandra, since this la la late time upper limit really helps to determine the time of the jet uh, for the jet break. So again, Chandra is super important to get this late time information, since uh, if we couldn't have these two data points here, with Swift XRT, we would have just a single power law. And for the case of triple power law, I show in uh, 05, 12, 21A. This, uh, we have more information at early times, but since we are interested in the late times, I'm ignoring that in this uh, fitting. And we see it again, the importance of the late time information for uh, from Chandra to determine the time of the jet break that by, by I cannot can be very uh, appealing. And as a sneak peek, uh, two weeks ago, I'm showing the case of 210726A. Uh, this is a short GRB that, thanks to the uh, Chandra Group and uh, Pat Slane, we got accepted our TO on this uh, GRB and we got three Chandra epochs. And there are several things that I want to underline in this short GRB. One is that it's a very bright short GRB. Uh, this last uh, Chandra data point, the third, third epoch, is a uh, at up to 14 days and it's still very bright. And if you can see it's kind of decaying, but it might be here uh, a slight indication of a jet break. Uh, we are still working on this because we now we have to do a, a fitting that uh, has into account also the Swift uh, information because right now I'm only doing the Chandra. And as you can see here, there is a little uh, enhance in X-rays. And this is also very weird. Uh, so we are also, uh, in, uh, investigating this uh, case. But anyway, uh, as you can see, Chandra is very important to get uh, the behavior of these uh, afterglows at late times for short GRBs. So if we put the results in numbers, um, we have 12 new GR short GRBs uh, from the ones that were published in 2015 with X-ray afterglow light curves. Uh, from the 11 births with uh, measurements or lower limits for opening angles. Uh, from them, four of them were opening angles, and two of them, two of them were in X-rays. We now have updated this because we have found with on our MCMC uh, uh, simulations that there are two breaks in X-rays for this data. So we have to update to four before 2015, and we have new three jet breaks, uh, so that sums three new jet opening angles. So in total, we have seven <laughs> opening angles for short GRBs. And now we also want to uh, infer, uh, we are also uh, inferring the lower limits for the opening angles of those GR, uh, GRBs that don't have jet breaks and uh, getting the, those uh, values into our analysis. So what is how we calculate the opening angles? Well. We want to have a jet opening angle value. 
we have information from X-rays, and from these uh, X-rays we can uh, infer the time of the jet break or the last uh, the, uh, detection in time for, in the X-rays. Uh, we will use in the in the case of a detection the posterior uh, of all the, the simulations for getting the distribution in times, and in the case of a lower limit, we also will use just the last time, uh, the last detection time in X-rays. We also have uh, some distributions in the of the isotropic energies and certain vast densities, and this is uh, we get it from multi wavelength observations. That that's mean that means from the optical, the near infrared, radio, and X-rays. And we also have information from the optical if, uh, that we get uh, from the host galaxies that we can infer redshifts to for these uh, short ERBs. So if we glue all together and we put all together this information uh, in the case, and this is a preliminary result all, only for those uh, cases that we detected at jet break, if we plot the uh, cumulative, uh, cumulative distribution function uh, for the opening angles, we see that we have a mean value of 4.6. This is a new value before it was six, and all the uh, angles detection uh, detected angles are between two and eight. And now we are working on uh, introducing opening angles. Sorry, the lower limits for opening angles that are larger, more uh, than five, and putting physical limits of 30 and 90 degrees. For that, we are going to use uh, survival statistics. And nice. thank you. And now uh, I would like to introduce for, uh, to you like uh, also an, uh, another preliminary result in the two event rate. From this value, we can establish a upper limit uh, for the two event rate of this uh, short year base. And we can say that all the events are, uh, this rate is less than uh, 3000 events per, per uh, gigapar cubic gigaparsec per year. Um, so now if we introduce lower limits, this number will shift towards the left to lower uh, numbers. And we expect uh, to reduce this in uh, at least in uh, one order of magnitude that, uh, and therefore we want to establish and constrain a better uh, a true event rate than the one that we got in 2015. And just for underlying something important is that in last June, uh, to uh, events uh, were published and announced as a neutron star black hole merger. So if we put into account this uh, information, we see that the true event rate de derived from neutron star black hole mergers, uh, we see that only a very a small percentage of short GRBs may have such events as progenitors. So um, it, this really puts us into worse the neutron star, neutron star mergers for short ERBs. And I leave you here with my conclusions. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me and I'm opening to uh, other, on all the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very interesting talk. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A or in the Slack channel uh, and we will address them. While we're waiting for the audience to put questions in, I have a question for you about uh, the technique that you're using. Can it be used as a predictive algorithm to, to say, um, because you have all of these observations, when you, if you're doing these three models for them, if you leave off the last data, can you make some prediction about what observation criteria you need to meet those different um, out, potential outcomes, like if you have a break that you don't see yet, but you expect to be coming. Mm. So you mean if we have a criteria for uh, triggering for some like or late time uh, observations of Chandra and X-Men? Yeah, especially in that case. Yeah. So yeah, we, uh, based on our experience, we have a criteria that is uh, where the so the decay index that you saw the light curve has to be uh, like uh, shallower than minus one. Uh, we also need to have a certain flux uh, around one day after the trigger of the GRB in X-rays uh, in the Swift XRT, of course, because it's the first uh, that goes and observes the GRBs. Uh, but I think in the case, sorry about this, um, but yeah, I. I think this is one of the 
uh, a sample site, for example, for 2005, 2022A, we really don't know what is going to happen here. So that's why we, we have all these characteristics or the trigger conditions at the beginning with SWIFT. And then we see what ha happens in the late time observations. But we need these uh, observations there just to catch at late time, well, late time, uh, three, uh, jet break at late times. That, and that's exactly what I'm thinking about there. Mm -hmm. You you have, if you were to, from your MCMC mm -hmm. um, um, calculations, you should have all of a spread of predictions for what might happen there. Uh, mm -hmm. So would would they would they indicate to you like, you know, um, mm -hmm. how deep you'd have to go, for example, in order to make sure that the most likely uh, breaks there would be detected. Mm. So, uh, for uh, in this uh, case, for these cases, uh, we have to give the MCMC uh, like a initial guess of where the time break, the time for the jet break, is going to be, and we establish that it's always after one day, but. Mm. We really don't know if it is going to be at two days or uh, three days. Um, so the MCMC will fine tune that that thing depending on the posterior. Right. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that's all the time for questions there. I haven't seen any come up here, but if you do have any, put them in the Slack and I'm sure Alicia can get to them there. Uh, we'll have our next speaker share their slides while I introduce them. Um, our next speaker is Unshuman Acharya, Achara, and uh, is going to talk to us. Uh, it's coming to us from the Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research, and the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics, and is going to talk to us about searching for variability in HD one seven nine nine four nine. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope my slides are visible and I'm audible. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Anshuman Acharya. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from ISA Mohali, India, and I will be an incoming PhD student at MPA Kaching uh, starting in September. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the search for variability in HD1799 and on which I work with my collaborators listed here. So, yeah. We are interested in HD1799 and which was a Sun like star with a close and hot Jupiter mass uh, uh, planet, and it was observed with Chandra. So while analyzing the spectra, we did a couple of interesting things. Uh, we were hunting for spectral variability using hardness ratios, and then we were computing the goodness of fit using the cache statistic uh, to evaluate the different fitting models that we we're using. Then we were trying to improve upon the fitting models we were using by using the cumulative sum of residuals. Lastly, we improved upon our error calculations using the Bayesian spectral fitting. And the entire process of going through all these steps does allow us to comprehensively analyze our data and give us a lot more confidence about our results. Uh, we started off with the light curves. We were focusing on the soft and the broad bands uh, given in red and uh, black here, the soft being 0.5 to 1.2 keV and broad 0.5 to 7 keV. And uh, we were trying to look for count rate variability. And the reduced chi-square that we got from that uh, was quite promising. We saw quite high values, and thus we, it was like a good uh, idea to go for the next step, which was to calculate the hardness ratios, for which we used BEAR, uh, which is a Bayesian estimation of hardness ratios by Park et al. 2006. And it's a uh, command line C program, which was uh, which is which quickly estimates our hardness ratios and whatever uncertainties are attached to it. Like, for example, for uh, one of the OBS IDs uh, uh, of the data sets that we used, we get something like this. Uh, looking into that and looking at the reduced chi-square from that gave us uh, uh, the following values given in green, where we were uh, where the hard band was from 1.2 to 8 kV and soft band was as before. Uh, here we saw that okay uh, we have two uh, OBS IDs out of five uh, where we do see uh, spectral variability, which is good, but uh, uh, we need to know more. Uh, so for that, what we did was to go for spectral fitting, and we use multiple models for this. We were uh, and uh, we used the cast statistic to basically uh, evaluate the goodness of fit of these models uh, using the method described by JS Castor 2017. 
what this basically does is we compare the difference between the expected and the actual C stat value relative to the expected variance of the, of the models. Uh, and if we get a result which is less than two sigma, we could say that, all right, this is a good fit for a model. But what we observed was that we had multiple uh, models, which were two temperature variable abundance models, uh, which were giving us good uh, CSTAT values. Like for example, for OPS ID 5427, we had two models with 1.37 sigma and uh, 0.82 sigma. Uh, so how do we distinguish between them? So we looked Minutes. into the residual, uh, we looked into the residuals uh, uh, that we get from the model and the uh, data and try to understand if there are systematics in them. Uh, so, uh, uh, to understand that we calculated the cumulative sum of the residuals. Now, how do we interpret it? Uh, for that, we generated a large number of simulated spectra using fake PHA on Chow. And we compared the fraction of the observed cumulative sum of residuals, uh, points, which were beyond the five to 95 percentile uh, bounds of the simulated spectra. Uh, then we try to note where exactly does the residual blow up? Like for example, here it is blowing up at around 0.8 KV. And uh, we uh, uh, try to thaw the suitable abundance parameter associated with that energy and re refit the model and uh, check if it improves our cumulative sum calculation. Uh, the uh, improvement can be seen from these two graphs. So the top model was improved to the bottom model uh, uh, where we, ha we have the cumulative sum to not uh, blow up anymore. And that's an improved model, which we uh, used and proceeded further. Lastly, we saw that when we have multiple uh, uh, abundance of multiple parameters that are varying, the error uh, calculation can be problematic on Sherpa. So we use the Bayesian spectral fitting algorithm get draws on Chow, uh, which implements the pie blocks code from Van Dyke et al. 2001, uh, which provided us a much better measure for our errors on the abundance parameters, thus giving us the results listed here, which I can discuss later if uh, on Slack. So to summarize, we uh, were able to successfully hunt for spectral variability in two out of five uh, data sets. And uh, oh, the new things that we did implement was to use the cache statistic uh, to evaluate the goodness of fit, which was an excellent comparative tool between fit models. Then when we have a good model, we can use the cumulative sum of residuals to basically improve the fitting model to get the best possible fit uh, so that we have a, a good understanding of the spectra. And lastly, we use Bayesian spectral fitting to improve the error calculation. All right, I can be open for questions now. Excellent presentation, Oshiman. Uh, definitely put your questions for him in the Slack, and I'm sure he'll be happy to address them. Very interesting stuff. Uh, we're out of time for questions right now, so I'd like our next speakers okay, sure. to start sharing their slides. Perfectly on time, five minutes. <laughs> um, our next speaker is coming to us from the University of Utah and is Antoine Dumont, who is going to talk to us about surprisingly strong K-band emission found in LLAGNs. You're presently muted. Antoine, if you're talking, you're muted. Sorry about that. That's now, okay. <laughs> now you can see me and hear me, right? Yes. <laughs> Um, all right. Thanks, uh, Rodolfo. Uh, first, I would like to thank all the organizers for a, a wonderful workshop and also letting me uh, uh, present my work here. Um, I'm going to be talking about this paper that we wrote last year with collaborators about uh, k band emission in low luminosity GNs. Uh, the motivation to study low luminosity GNs uh, comes from uh, mostly two facts. Uh, first, that uh, quasars are rare. Uh, most of the uh, flux limit uh, samples that are to study GNs uh, study bright uh, uh, quasars, but they're actually not um, um, uh, dominant in the universe and they're not characteristic of uh, the majority of the galaxies we observe. Uh, in fact, observations show that um, the majority of the black holes are in the center of galaxies are creating far below their Eddington ratios and uh, telling us at some point uh, all the galaxies uh, behave as a low luminosity GN. And second, uh, they have uh, they show a different spectral energy distribution that brighter AGNs, um, like in the blue bump, uh, the optical and, and UV wavelengths, um, and uh, showing an excess of uh, radio emission and uh, radio wavelengths, uh, and sometimes having a red bump and then um, medium infrared wavelengths. Uh, all of these tell us that the uh, low luminosity GNs have a different accretion mechanism that is not very well understood uh, yet. Um, 
classically studying the AGN emission in the ion infrared is uh, challenging, uh, especially from the strong starlight uh, contamination, uh, especially at low luminosities. And because of that reason, we need uh, high uh, spatial and spectros spectroscopic data to, to be able to do this task. With this in mind, we can uh, collect a sample of 15 known low luminosity GNs that have dynamical supermassive black hole detection uh, measurements. Uh, they have the nuclear X-ray detected uh, 2 to 10 kV, and uh, most important, have high resolution adapted optics Gemini NIF uh, K-band IFU data. Um, and we restricted our sample to uh, GNs that have they are accreting at less than 0 0.1 of their Eddington limits. Uh, our sample is the the first work to systematically address uh, aging emission at these luminosities, and uh, we are an average four orders uh, of magnitude below previous similar studies. What we have done is use this IFU data and to fit the spectra at every pixel with a combination of stellar templates and uh, thermal emission from uh, uh, templates from different black body temperatures. And as you can see in the plot in the right, uh, an example of our fits, uh, the spectra showing red um, has a somehow shallower slope than the stellar templates. Uh, and we are only able to fit it when we combine these two to uh, this, the thermal emission with the stellar templates to get uh, the black uh, line, which is our best fit. Two minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, using this technique, where we are able to uh, trace the, the aging emission and oh, different radii of the of the galaxy, and you can see our uh, uh, there is you can see in the plot in the left that is highly centered and uh, highly compact in, in just containing the usually in the 0.3 arc seconds radii. And we develop a test also to see if this aging emission is in reality, sorry, this thermal emission is in reality aging activity or it can be uh, produced by other mechanisms. So we developed this test that you can see on the right between combining the slope of the continuum that I was talking before with the CO band head line depth. Um, usually you expect a positive correlation between these two quantities with uh, radar stars, having more deep lines and bluer, younger stars having uh, shallower lines. And that's what we see for the outer uh, pixels of the galaxy, but for the center ones that are shown here in purple, you see an anti-correlation between these two quantities that cannot be really explained by any uh, uh, stellar process, telling us this uh, is uh, highly likely aging activity. With this, uh, our results tell us that long luminosity GNs are very bright in the near infrared, in fact, much brighter than we thought previously. Uh, they show a tight correlation between uh, the uh, X ray and the low luminosity GN and the, and the near infrared. Uh, it's not as tight as um, the, this similar relation for brighter AGNs. Uh, and this um, near infrared to X ray emission seems to increase towards uh, lower Eddington ratios, with some galaxies showing sometimes 100 times more AGN luminosity in the K band than in the X ray. This may, be, this may tell us that there is a change of mechanism uh, at a lower, extreme low accretion rates, probably jets. Um, and these techniques uh, can be very useful uh, in the future, especially looking at uh, the future with the JWST that is going to have two orders of magnitude uh, more sensitive at wavelengths, at similar wavelengths uh, than ground um, uh, based telescopes. Uh, then, and also, I'm pleased to uh, tell that uh, we just got a proposal accepted in Chandra that is going to help us to study 22 galaxies that is also have Gemini NIF data and um, to populate more this uh, um, uh, uh, sample of the data uh, of the uh, low luminosity uh, AGN. And it will tell us uh, a little bit more to clarify this correlation and also uh, the underlying physical mechanism uh, of these low luminosity GMs. So, with that, I would like to conclude and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Antoine. That was excellent. And you can ask Antoine a question in the Slack channel if you have an opportunity to. We're out of time right now to field questions. I'd like to ask our next speaker to share their slides. Our next speaker is invited speaker Christian Snyder from Hamburgers and Wart and Wart. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's going to talk to us about machine learning and Bayesian techniques to harvest large X ray source catalogs. Yes. Hello, everybody. I, I don't see your slides. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> that was a... Now you should see the slides. You should see yes. me and the slides. Definitely. Thank you.
Thanks. So exactly. So this talk is specifically about stars, which is an object class that gets well some attention in X-rays, despite its fact that it's actually the second most abundant class of X-ray sources on the sky with limited, with flux limited uh, observations. And so our task is to identify the stars in X-ray data. So given an X-ray image like this, or more specifically the source catalog that pertains to that image, pick the stars. And about 10 to even 70% of the stars, depending on the location on the sky um, of the uh, X-ray sources are stars. And we wanna know which stars, uh, which of the X-ray sources are the stars. And in my talk, I will specifically use Erosita data. And that is because um, Chandra and XMM Newton and other uh, X-ray observatories have produced large X-ray catalogs, but they will be outnumbered greatly by Erosita. So we expect to detect approximately 1 million stars in X-rays. So this is a task um, and this will really help us to better understand stellar X-ray astronomy. So a brief introduction to Erosita on board the Spectrum Ranking Gamma mission. Um, Erosita is a successor of the ROSAT survey. Uh, it performs a soft and hard X-ray all sky survey. Um, one survey every six months and in total eight surveys. It's a joint German-Russian mission. Um, Germany uh, delivered the Erosita instrument and Russia the um, platform, the satellite platform and the launch, as well as on the hard X-ray telescope. And therefore, uh, there's a data split. Germany gets part of the sky. And in fact, the Western part in galactic coordinates and the Russians get the Eastern part of the sky. Uh, the Spectrum Röntgen Gamma mission was launched in 2019 from Baikonur um, and then traveled to L2. And on the journey to L2, it performed a number of performance verifications, observations, um, especially uh, the EFETS field. And the survey itself uh, is ongoing since December 2019. And earlier this year, we released the uh, data from the performance verification phase. So this is the oh, this is the uh, EFETS field. Um, on the right, you see the exposure map. Um, the EFETS field uh, covers approximately 140 square degrees on the sky, observed during four days. And you see in the exposure map these bright um, circles. And this is where the uh, telescope paused before starting the scan. So the observations were done in a manner that is similar to the all sky survey to uh, check the performance of the scan itself. And these are the points where the instrument uh, halted before uh, performing the scan. So this, but except of the, those points, uh, really this, this field is very representative of the all sky survey. And we have approximately 28,000 sources in the uh, catalog. Um, a brief outline of the talk. I will start by introducing why we use Gaia for identifying the stars, how we perform the cross matching with the catalog and what is the catalog fraction. That is a property that uh, applies to all catalog cross matching procedures and it produces a very relevant number for us. Then how we do the classification as stellar and a few results that re that uh, uh, describe the stellar sample in Erosita. So why do we use Gaia? Well, stars typically obey the so-called saturation limit. That is during quiescent phases, the maximum X-ray to volumetric flux is 10 to the minus three. And given any particular X-ray sensitivity, that then translates into um, limiting optical magnitude. So this is an example for uh, X-ray limiting flux of 10 to the minus 15 ergs per second per square centimeter, so typical Chandra observation. And most of the sources, the X-axis is a spectral type, 
A to M, um, translates to a Gaia magnitude that is brighter um, than the Gaia detection limit. On the other hand, most sources are at the dim limit, it's the lower end of the brightness, and those have not the best Gaia quality. So for example, their parallax measurements so are not as good as for brighter sources, and we don't really know their precise distance. But thankfully, Erosita is a little less um, deep than a typical general observation. So for, for Erosita, this uh, curve would be somewhat higher. And most of the sources actually have well-defined Gaia measurements. On the other hand, Gaia contains a number of sources that are not stellar and are especially not reasonable counterparts for our, for our X-ray sources. And that is, has to do with the um, saturation limit, but also with their position in a color magnitude diagram. So our counterparts should be genuine stars, not any other source type like white dwarfs or anything like that, even though these other sources may have a significant parallax and would be galactic sources. But we are specifically interested in the stars, so young to main sequence stars and giants. And this is then, um, after screening at the Gaia catalog, um, it contains only what we call eligible counterparts. So these are really, in our sense, genuine um, stars. So when we do the cross-matching, then we all know that the X-ray data itself uh, is insufficient to decide the stellar nature, and we need other information. And what we then classify is not the X-ray source itself, but the association. So how certain are we that the entry A in catalog one, for example, the Chandra catalog or the Erosita catalog is really physically related with entry B from the second catalog, for, in this case, the Gaia catalog. And this has for us the additional benefit that the catalog, the Gaia catalog after our screening contains only stars. So if the association between the X-ray source and the Gaia source is very likely, then that X-ray source is very likely also stellar. So what are properties of good associations? Well, it's easy to find the nearest neighbor. The, um, that will produce a sample of probable candidates, but will also be perhaps very incomplete and may have a high fraction of random association in the sample. And what we try to do is to add additional association properties to improve the sample quality. And that then translates in the question for the machine learning, namely to identify the regions in the multidimensional parameter space where the ratio between true and fake associations is high. Um, and furthermore, every association needs some quality measurement. So how certain are we that that association is correct? Otherwise, well, we cannot construct samples with any meaningful statistical properties. So there are two measurements or measures that are relevant, that is the reliability. So how many fake stars do we have in our sample? And this is easily um, estimated by shifting the X-ray sources on the sky, but some arbitrary sky distance, not too much, but also not too little. And because there may be some structure on the sky, this gives us the rate of false positives. But a more um, challenging question to address is the completeness of the sample. How many true stars do we miss in our sample? That true X-ray stars. We can try to address that by a sample of known so objects that we know have to be in the, in the final catalog, in our X-ray star catalog. Or if we have calibrated association probabilities, then we can just sum them up and we know how many stars did we miss. And the important part here is that we have to have calibrated association probabilities. They should be really on an absolute scale and not just relative to each other. 
And there comes the catalog fraction into play. That is the fraction of X-ray sources that have a counterpart in the match catalog. So this is an example. This is just one random field. Well, it's not a random field, it's the Hyades. Um, in red are the Gaia sources, and in blue are Rosat sources. So, and you see that well, some of those, actually the majority, do have a counterpart. Uh, every Rosat source has a counterpart in Gaia, but not everyone. There are sources that are missing in our match catalog. That could be because they are perhaps background AGN that are not in Gaia. It could be because they are spurious X-ray sources. But what we really want to know is how many of the Rosat or X-ray sources have a real counterpart in our match catalog. And that's very relatively straightforward. You look at the nearest neighbor distribution that is shown here on the left. So you calculate the match distance between the X-ray source and its nearest neighbor. You plot that, and then you fit it with a model. And the model contains only one single parameter, namely the catalog fraction. The distribution of random associations is simply derived by the uh, source density in the match catalog, so the density of Gaia sources in our field of X-ray sources, and the peak or the distribution of match distances for the real sources is given by the positional accuracy of the real sources, so the measurement accuracy. And we do have those two properties for each individual source. So the only part that we can trigger with is the fraction or the height of that peak here. And if we do that, we find with relatively high accuracy the number of sources that are contained in the match catalog. And for the EFETS field, because it is an extra galactic field, the fraction is somewhat below 10% or so. But that would apply to actually any catalog cross-matching. So looking at the nearest neighbor, or if it's a crowded field to a higher nearest neighbor, so second nearest, third nearest neighbors, it will give you an estimate of the real number of sources in your match catalog. And if you know that, then it's relatively simple to guess that, well, with that information, we can, uh, we know the completeness of our sample. The catalog fraction itself is independent of physics. Obviously, there's no physics involved, but it um, affects all associations and the probabilities. So without knowing that, the probabilities are likely to be off. But knowing the uh, number of real matches in the match code or in, yeah, real matches gives us the information of the completeness in our sample. So this closes the circle. We know the number of true matches from the nearest neighbor distribution. We know the number of random matches from shifting the X-ray sources. So we tune our algorithms to return n real sources. In fact, that's a choice. That means that the number of missed and the number of misclassified sources is equal. That is not necessarily the best accuracy or for that matter, any other metric. But with that choice, uh, we hope that the sample properties are representative of the sample in general. So we have the, the correct number of sources and their properties should be reasonably close to what the total sample or the full sample should look like. So how we perform the classification, let me remind you that we classify the associations, not the X-ray sources. So these are the most relevant association properties that we look at. The match distance is obviously one of the most important ones. Um, but it's also, for example, the local sky density that is important, or the physical distance between the sun and the star. And that is because it's, if the star is more closer to the sun, that is a, the, 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 a good match is closer to the sun, that is more likely the current counterpart that is a star that is very distant because there are very few stars that are close on the sky and close uh, to the sun. So for many properties here, there's smaller is better. And that 
um, motivates our choice of the machine learning algorithm, namely the support vector machine. Um, the support vector machine tries to identify or construct a, a maximum margin hyperplane that separates the, uh, in its most primitive form two object classes that's sufficient for us, stars and non-stars. Um, initially, that was only a linear model, but using the kernel trick, one can extrapolate that to other kernels, so polynomial or radial base functions. And it also works uh, if the separation is not perfect. The uh, support vector machine has, has, in our case, a very welcome um, property that the farther you are from the uh, separating hyperplane, uh, the more confident you are in your classification of the object. And that mirrors the smaller is better property um, that many of our association properties have. Um, the support vector machine is a supervised machine learning algorithm, so we need a training sample. And we construct it training sample from the data itself. Um, sources have very small match distances, are likely correct, and there is a low chance that there are random matches in that sample. So this is mathematically relatively straightforward to simulate. Um, and we can then train a geometric support vector machine um, with that simulated data to select a number of sources or a number of associations um, such that more than 95% of the associations are real associations, not random associations. We then apply that geometric support vector machine to the uh, uh, Erosita data and that returns us um, the training data. Unfortunately, that training data would have two small match distances, so we have to re-randomize uh, the geometric match properties before um, training then the real uh, classifier. Um, so for the real classifier, we use a polynomial kernel of uh, fourth order, and we tune the hyperparameters such that the classifier returns uh, n real sources as stellar. Again, then we have the number of missed and the number of misclassified sources is equal. Uh, the support vector machine produces probabilities or at least it claims to do so, but those are not very well calibrated. Therefore, we rescale the probabilities such that the number of spurious sources is the opposite, the sum of the opposite probabilities. And if we do that, um, this is the classifier's performance. Uh, on the x-axis, you see p stellar. So this is we, uh, this is the value of p stellar, the cutoff in p stellar for the associations that we include in the sample. So for example, here at 90%, those would be all sources that have association probabilities more than 90% would be included in the sample that would produce a sample that is 60% complete and 95% reliable. And our sweet spot here, or where we tuned the classifier, is uh, somewhat below 60% association probability gives us 90% completeness and reliability. Then we also applied a second uh, method, namely the Bayesian method that is based on the Budavari Salai, Salai um, uh, framework that we have extended with the information from the real sources uh, for the number of real sources and the physical properties, especially the activity as a function of stellar color or spectral type. And this is the uh, what we call the bias map, um, which essentially describes the rate or ratio between fake and real sources. So it's very unlikely to find a real source in this region, but it's very likely to find a real source in this part of the diagram. And in comparison, turns out that both classifiers actually perform very similar. The uh, dashed lines are the support vector machines and the full line 
um, is the bias, uh, are the values for the bias a classifier. And there are also these dotted lines, and these are for the uh, geometric uh, classification. And the improvement may look not very um, spectacular, but in fact, the relevant part is that part that's missing here. So we reduce the number of false positives in the sample by approximately a factor of two um, by using these two classifiers. Um, with the calibrated probabilities, this is the comparison, it's a 2D histogram of the probabilities um, for the support vector machine on the x-axis or in that direction and the bias classifier on that direction. And you see that uh, most sources actually get very high or very low association probabilities. This is exactly what we know. We want to discriminate between both object classes. There are only very few that are in this um, range, this mediocre probability range. There's also this structure here where the support vector machine uh, assigns very high association probabilities while the uh, bias classifier does not. And those are mostly sources that are relatively nearby because that's an information that the support vector machine has and that the bias classifier does not have. So the dots here are sources within 100 parsec. So a few sample properties. This is the fractional X-ray luminosity of a G-band flux. So it's essentially um, uh, X-ray flux over volumetric flux. And you see that most sources are reasonably close to the uh, saturation limit. That is to be expected because there we have the largest uh, horizon and the largest volume. Um, so most sources are close to the saturation limit. But there are also sources, especially in the F and G type spectral types, that are significantly below the situation limit. And most and sources, it's, it's thanks. Um, most sources are, as you see here from the color coding, are uh, between two and maybe five hundred parsec or so. Um, the difference here in the samples that result, most sources are actually classified similarly by both classifiers. Um, the, there are some sources, especially in the, in the boundary parts here, um, that only the bias uh, classifier classifies as stellar, and not the support vector machine. This is a comparison in match distance. So uh, they are for, for the largest part, they are uh, very similar. There's somewhat more sources, uh, a few more sources at larger match distances for the support vector machine. And this is mirrored here in the distance distribution. Um, the support vector machine um, yeah, uses the distance information parsec to upgrade sources or to, to assign higher probabilities to an association than the uh, bias classifier because the bias factor does not really use the distance information. This is a color magnitude diagram that results from the uh, from both classifiers for the bias on the left and for the support vector machine on the right. And you can hardly see any difference here. But what you can see is that most sources are between 40 million and four giga years old. So a typical X-ray star is relatively young. Which brings me to the summary. Both machine learning and Bayesian methods achieve approximately 90% completeness and reliability in classifying Erosita sources as stellar. That's a typical value that we find also if we look at other samples. Um, the probabilities that both methods predict agree very well, and they are uh, accurately calibrated. So you can use them to construct smaller or larger samples with a known completeness and reliability figures. Then the samples that result when applying those classifiers show the expected features. Most sources are near the saturation limit. Inactive stars are closer to us and mainly found in the F and G types. And the average X-ray star is young. Brings me to the outlook. Well, obviously we will apply those methods to the X-ray all sky survey performed by Erosita. There are a few new challenges that we have to face when doing so. Uh, the properties of the stellar sample change with galactic position. Um, 
mainly uh, the galactic uh, plane, uh, the, where we have a lot of stars, while the way very few AGN are seen through the galactic disk. Uh, also the catalog fraction, so the fraction of stars in the X-ray catalog changes with galactic uh, latitude. You can see he this here on the right side, this is from rosa data actually, but you see that in the plane, the catalog fraction is very high while it's quite low towards the poles. And because EOSITA performs multiple scans over the sky, we can also use the variability information. And in fact, we also plan to include additional association properties and one is uh, the X-ray information, the hardness ratio, and we found that the stars are typically a little softer in X-rays than the other uh, source classes like AGN. Um, from preliminary tests, we figure that um, we will achieve similar completeness and reliability ratios, approximately 90%, hopefully a little better even. And the very same techniques can be applied to the Chandra data. Um, although the deepness of the Chandra data may mean that uh, Gaia, well, it's not as complete for Chandra as it is for uh, Erosita. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christian, for that very interesting talk. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> in the Slack channel that I will ask now. Uh, Huiyang asks, uh, says, thank you for your talk. For an X-ray source with multiple Gaia counterparts within its position error, do you classify it with all the possible matches? And, uh, we, go yeah. ahead. we look at all possible matches. And in fact, um, if, they are more, if there's more than one plausible counterpart, that improves or increases the association probability. Yes. And then the question is, what, a, what is their situation if none of the counterpart is a real match? Well, that's the, the most likely uh, option. For, for the EFETS field, 90% of the X resources do not have a reasonable counterpart. So th that is, we have two source categories, stars and no stars. So, well, mm -hmm. we call that ghost sources because they are just not in our our match catalog. Um, in fact, we are working with the people from the MPE that look at the Erosita data uh, at large and mainly look at the AGN or other sources. So yeah, that is an, a route that we may follow in the future. But at the moment, we are looking only at stars and we treat other source categories in the non-star category on a, a statistical basis. Thank you. Uh, we have time for some more questions. There's a number here. I'm going to go through two of them really quickly. Uh, do you know one person is asking for the data release schedule of eRosita? I think we can copy that to the channel later. It sh should be available on the website. Uh, the other one is asking if your code is usable by others. This is from Mayan uh, Somanak. Uh, it, it is on GitHub. It's just not uh, well released, but yeah, drop me a mail and uh, I'll send you the link. It's yeah. And then we have a question from Koji Mukai, um, who asks: uh, For either Chandra or Erosita cases, are there more distant stars in the sample for which you have to worry about the ISM uh, optical reddening and X-ray absorption? Uh, yes, no. So these are there are some more distant sources, uh, kiloparsec and beyond. Um, on the other hand, we only detect them if they are X-ray active, which means they have also a relatively, for stellar uh, sources, hard spectra, where the uh, extinction is not so severe. Right. So, but yes, there are distant sources that uh, suffer extinction, and especially young stars would be prone to extinctions. Right. Uh, and the follow-up question to that, I think, is the one that I had about the time dependence, which you kind of hinted at the end there. Um, th a lot of these earlier types will have a flaring events where the LXL ball will rise because you're not measuring those two parameters simultaneously. Do you see any evidence for that in the... Uh... Yes. So there's 
a, a specific paper also in the Erosita uh, paper splash, where I think three quarters uh, of the sources that are variable are stars. Um, and this uh, saturation limit only applies to the quiescent emission. So during flares, the stars may be much more distant, or we could detect stars that are much more distant. Um, at the moment, we have for, for EFETs, we have not looked at the variability, um, but for, for the future, we will use the information from the multiple sky scans to uh, yeah, assess the variability and look on the, on the quiescent part of the spectrum, not the flares. Excellent. Uh, thank you for your excellent talk. And if you want to respond to some of the questions in the Slack, feel free to jump in there at your leisure. I'd like our next speaker to share their slides. And now while I introduce them, our next speaker is Eric Miller from MIT Kavli Institute. He's going to talk to us about next generation event characterization, characterization techniques. All right. Thank you very much, Rudy. Um, yes, I am indeed going to talk about uh, event characterization techniques for the next generation of X-ray instruments, and also how that relates a bit to Chandra. Okay, um, uh, this is work um, that's based on the work of a, a fairly large collaboration. I want to especially highlight uh, the people I'm showing here in Magenta. Um, and uh, the work I'm gonna be talking about today is um, uh, based on a paper that um, we're going to hopefully submit in just a couple of weeks. And that paper is led by Beverly Lamar and Gregory Purgosian, uh, both with our team at MIT. You have to move some Zoom windows around. Okay, there we go. Um, so I hope it's not too controversial for me to make the statement to this group that uh, X-ray imaging spectrometers are really great. Uh, in particular, uh, X-ray CCDs count individual photons and in so doing are able to measure the energy of those photons. And so um, over the last couple of decades, these instruments have been providing spatially resolved spectral information basically for free, just as a function of the way they work. Uh, in the optical world, these things, sorts of things are called integral field units or IFUs, and it's a relatively new technology. Uh, but as I said, uh, we've been doing this in x-rays for several decades now. Now, in order to get the best spectral response and the most information from this, we need to be able to reconstruct the photon energy uh, of the event that each photon produces. And so the questions I want to address in the next few minutes are, are we doing that right? Can we do that better? And especially, what can we do uh, for future detectors? And the challenges that we'll have with future detectors compared to things like ACES on Chandra are that we'll have smaller pixels to sample a small PSF. We'll have thicker devices to improve the hard X-ray quantum efficiency. And both of those are challenges for reconstructing photon energy. The, the picture I want you to have in your mind as I talk about this is this concept of grades, which dates back again, a couple of decades to Asuka, um, where uh, a, an X-ray event is graded based on how many pixels have detectable sig uh, signal. And that grade, that pixel pattern is used both to reconstruct the total energy of the event and also to decide whether that event is likely to be an X-ray or a particle induced event. So have that picture in your mind. Okay, so um, we need to understand exactly how that charge, uh, that charge distribution into pixels is generated. And so I have here a, uh, a schematic of a very simplified X-ray CCD. Oops, sorry, my zoom windows are still in the way. I think I'd have this figured out by now. Okay, so this shows something similar to um, ACES S3, a backside illuminated CCD on Chandra or XIS-1, which is a backside illuminated CCD that flew on Suzaku. Um, this shows a side view, a cutaway view, and we're looking at uh, basically the length of a pixel. So this is 24 microns. This is about 50 microns. This is the thickness uh, of the CCD. Uh, this is the backside. So a back, backside illuminated CCD, X-rays come in here. Um, there is a voltage applied across this substrate, which sets up an electric field. And so when electrons are generated by that photon interaction, they travel, they feel that electric field and travel very quickly down here to the gate side where they are collected. All right, so I'm going to have a little animation and hopefully this will actually work over Zoom. Here's your X-ray coming in. It interacts in the silicon, produces a cloud of numerous electrons. And those electrons being charged feel the electric field and they travel down to where they're collected here in what's called the buried channel. Um, now, this is just the integration phase uh, there's also a phase where you then read out that information in sort of bucket brigade fashion for a CCD, but I'm going to completely ignore that in this talk. We're only talking about how these things are generated and collected within the CCD. 
Uh, okay. Um, so that's a schematic, but what's really happening in there? So the charge cloud, as I showed, drifts to the gates in response to this electric field. Uh, as it's doing that, the individual electrons, which have some energy because they are warm, also random walk. And we call that diffusion. And that's really the primary driver that we're trying to understand here. So to understand what the final pixel patterns or grades are, we need to model both of those things. Um, turns out to be difficult to do, but fortunately we have some tools to do that now. In particular, we've used this software package called Poisson CCD, which was developed by Craig Lage and collaborators, uh, mainly to model the CCDs that are being used for the Vera, Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, however, the, um, we can use these for x-rays and Craig Lage has been very helpful in uh, adapt, helping us adapt these for our modeling of our own x-ray CCDs that we're uh, developing right now. Okay. Um, and so um, I should point out that this does two things. First of all, it, it solves Poisson's equation for the three-dimensional electric field at every location within the CCD. Once you have that electric field, then you can put electrons in there. You can essentially put an X-ray photon in there, which produces a little cloud of electrons and see what happens to, the, to those electrons uh, under the effects of that electric field. So here is one simulation that we've run of a CCD that's very similar to uh, the backside illuminated CCD on Chandra. And again, this is in this case, 45 microns thick. So this top up here is the backside. This is the entrance window, which is exposed to celestial X-rays. This is the backside, uh, sorry, this is the front side where the, uh, the gates are. Um, and there's a, a voltage across this. So there is an electric field built up. Now I'm playing very fast and loose with sign conventions. And in my universe, uh, electrons follow the arrow uh, and that's the direction they want to travel. So electrons will travel from yellow to blue and they will be collected down here in what we call pixels. The pixels aren't really physical things but they're set up by the, the, um, the electric field that's induced within this. Uh, the CCD. Okay, um, and we also have a notional device uh, that we've um, uh, simulated and, and tested in our lab as well. And this is something that could, for example, fly on something like Lynx or Axis or a future mission. And in this case, it has much smaller pixels to take advantage of uh, very high spatial resolution, about a third the size of uh, what's on ASUS. And it's much thicker so that um, we can get higher uh, energy photons detected, about twice the, the thickness. Okay, so one thing you should notice is that there's a, a, a really long way before you get down to where the pixels are defined. And that's very important because X-rays, the attenuation or the penetration depth of the X-ray depends on the energy of the X-ray. So what I'm plotting over here is that attenuation length is actually the absor prob absorption probability arbitrarily scaled. So a half a keV photon will interact within the first couple of microns of this uh, CCD. One and a half keV photon will interact uh, essentially all within the top half. And it's not until you get up to about six keV that the photons will penetrate to the point uh, where they can be near the gates or, or near where the pixels are defined. So for the vast majority of soft X-rays, where they interact up here is very far away from where they feel the effects of these pixels and are finally sorted into the pixel patterns that we read out as an event. Um, and so that has a, a dramatic impact on the final pixel pattern. Okay, but a, a movie is probably worth a thousand of, of those pictures. And so here now we've taken those electric fields uh, that we simulated um, and generated or, or uh, introduced electrons into them. So I'm gonna be showing some movies here. The one on the left here is of a six keV photon, which uh, in this case I've put at, so it penetrates one micron in depth. And that little blue uh, circle indicates where it interacted. A six keV photon produces about 1600 electrons. And so what you'll see um, is when I start this movie, you'll see those 1600 electrons as they move in the electric field. And that's them right there. So each of those little blue dots is an electron. There are 1600 of them there. And you see the vast majority of them end up in uh, in two pixels with a couple in these other pixels down here. Again, this is a, 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 a uh, an ACES-like CCD, so something that we're running now. Here's a half keV photon. Now these don't interact, don't penetrate very far. So I have this uh, interacting at about 0.5 microns. A 0.5 keV photon will produce about 10% of the number of electrons as a six keV photon, 140 electrons. And so I'll start this movie. So this again, this blue dot is where it interacts. And you can see a very similar thing happens. There are a lot fewer electrons, 
but they're basically feeling that strong electric field and moving very quickly to where they're collected in two phases. And I do want to point out that these uh, the visualization tools here, as well as the enhancements uh, to Poisson CCD code to develop these, um, were done by a, a, a second year undergraduate student here at MIT named Jared Scott. Um, so here are the notional future detectors that might fly on something like links or axis. And so these are twice as thick and have pixels that are uh, one third the size of what's on ASIS. So over here is that same six KeV photon. I have it uh, penetrating a little bit further, but not very much down to eight microns. So here's where it'll start. And you'll see the 1600 electrons. Um, they take a really long time to reach where they're collected into pixels. And as they do that, this cloud of electrons really diffuses quite a lot. Uh, and so instead of just covering two pixels, we're covering maybe nine or more pixels down at the bottom. Here's another 6 keV photon, same energy, but it can penetrate pretty far. And so I have this one interacting 65 microns in. And you can see this uh, a similar thing. It's, it's a fairly sizable cloud. And I apologize for the zoom hiccup, um, but it's still covering more than two pixels. Okay. And so um, how well can we measure the photon energy for these uh, sorts of photons in these notional devices? Well, first let's look about exactly how well we can measure it in something like an ASIS or Suzaku XIS CCD. So this is that six keV photon that I had. And now we're just looking at side views of the 1600 electrons as they meander their way down to where they're collected. And this is a top view of all of those electrons uh, identified as blue dots and where they're collected in the pixels. So you can see four of those blue dots, four electrons uh, managed to escape being collected in these two pixels. Um, of course, there is also noise. So when we read out each of these pixels, there's a little bit of noise that's introduced. And I, so I'm showing here that sort of schematically equivalent to three electrons of noise, uh, one sigma per pixel. And so in, in order to uh, measure the energy of the event, we have to impose a threshold because we don't wanna be including noise. And that threshold is usually uh, something like four times the um, sigma value of the readout noise. And so if we impose that threshold, we're going to throw out all of the pixels that aren't highlighted in magenta because they are below the noise threshold. And so we end up losing those four electrons. We only include what's in these magenta uh, squares, but that um, reduces the six keV photon to a detected 5.9 keV photon. So 20 eV is not so bad to lose. On the other hand, with this notional future device, which has smaller pixels and is much thicker, um, you can clearly see right now that there are electrons, a uh, significant number of electrons that are scattered outside of these uh, main pixels. And so if we have the same three electrons of noise, we impose the same kind of threshold, um, we're only going to allow signal from these nine pixels and all of these blue electrons account for 26 of the 1600 which is a difference of 100 eV. And that's not really so good. Uh, things get worse at 0.5 keV. 0.5 keV photons, I did not show you a simulation of this. This interacts right, right near the entrance window and uh, diffuses a lot. If we enforce, or if we include the same three, three electrons of readout noise and enforce the same threshold, we uh, only include these four pixels in the summed energy. And so we're losing about a third of the signal, which means this 0.5 keV photon is registered as 0.35 keV. And that's really, really not good. So there are two things to take away from this. Um, signal is lost in pixels below this split threshold or noise threshold. Uh, so you can sum up all of the pixels that you want, but then on the other hand, summing lots of noisy pixels increases the full width half max of your um, spectral response. So this kind of grade as we have it now is really not sufficient uh, for doing, um, for, for summing up the total energy of an event. So how can we improve things? Well, we can reduce the readout noise. And honestly, this is the number, number one best thing to do. If we can get the readout noise well below one electron, then a lot of these problems completely go away. Um, technically that's quite challenging, but we and other groups are certainly working on that. We can optimize the pixel size. And in fact, um, I showed an eight micron pixel, but both Lynx and Axis have baseline uh, pixels about twice that size, partly for these re reasons. And so that does help quite a bit. Um, but you can imagine some other missions might want smaller pixels. We can crank up the bias voltage. It turns out that doesn't help quite as much as you might think it does. Um, there, it, it, it does speed up how fast the electrons drift and reduce the amount of diffusion, but not greatly with the sorts of voltages that we're capable of, of operating these instruments with. 
Um, you can also adapt the split threshold. In fact, Suzaku XIS did this. So that's the softer photons uh, had a lower split threshold than the, higher the harder photons. That does help as long as your readout noise is fairly low. Or you can use all of the pixel information. As, as you can probably guess by the highlighting, that's what I'm going for here. Um, so I did mention that grades, in addition to being used to construct the photon energy, they're also used to discriminate background events. And I want to point out this talk that Catherine Grant is giving a week from tomorrow, the very first talk of the day, um, to talk about future ways of doing that. And I also want to point out that this is actually done right now um, with the defaint mode on Chandra. Suzaku uses the outer five by five pixel information, and so does XMM to discriminate these things. And I want to point out that this doesn't simply apply to CCDs, but any sort of um, uh, solid state pixelated imager like a CMOS or a depth fet, because we have not introduced any of the charge transfer, only how the charge is collected on the device. Two minutes. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, we can model event islands. And this is something that was recognized actually almost 20 years ago by Gregory Pergosian, um, who realized that these diffuse electron clouds are very in Gaussian. And so we can fit a two dimensional Gaussian each event, and then a Gaussian is easy to integrate. We just integrate the Gaussian, get the total energy of that event. Uh, so that's what I'm showing over here. This is a simulated event at 6 keV. This is a Gaussian surface that's fit to that. And these are just the residuals, just to show you that it's a really good fit. Even in the presence of this noise in the outer regions, um, we get a width of about 5.5 microns. It's actually smaller than a pixel. This is uh, yeah, the sigma. Um, and we're able to centroid it to about a quarter of a pixel. So that's actually also really good because that means you can get by with larger pixels uh, and, and have uh, still um, get really good sampling of your PSF. And of course, this is not new. This is part of what the uh, EDSER algorithm already does on Chandra. And this use of a Gaussian is really the, at the heart of this uh, paper um, led by uh, Bev and Greg that, I, that is coming up, which I wanna give a shout out to again. Okay, so my final slide, I'm just comparing uh, these different event reconstruction mechanism, uh, methods. So we have three energies here and we've accumulated thousands of events. So this is the response of the instrument to photons at that energy. And so if we use a, an OSCA type three by three grade to sum up the, uh, the energy, um, it does not a very good job. In fact, the real problem with it is that you lose events because most of the events have more than nine pixels. And so you throw them out as being particles. So this is kind of a, a dumb thing to do. But you can do something similar and just sum up all the pixels that are above the split threshold. Take like a seven by seven window or a nine by nine window and sum up everything. And that doesn't do such a bad job at high energies. You can see there's a gain offset. This dotted line shows you where the, the peak should be, but you can calibrate that as long as it's um, fairly well behaved. Um, at low energies, it really doesn't do very good. And this is what we exactly what we saw in the simulation. The, the read noise is uh, affecting or, or it's, it's basically um, causing you to lose charge below the, the, the noise threshold or split threshold. Um, and so you can fit a 2D Gaussian like I showed. This does a really good job of recovering all of the charge because it doesn't care so much what the noise is. It can recover pixels that have signal below the split threshold. So that's why the peak is very close to where it should be. Um, at low energies and intermediate energies, it does a much better job of just summing up the pixels. The width is very similar. At high energies, it doesn't. And, one of, and you see these broad tails here where there are actually significant numbers of events. And that is because the, uh, for very penetrating X-rays that, that interact very close to the gates, um, you end up with a lot of single pixel events and fitting a Gaussian to a, to a Delta function does not work well. So um, in fact, for what we probably want to do, and this is the takeaway that I think you, you want to take from this talk is a hybrid approach. Um, and this can be science driven. So for instance, you can determine whether you're more interested in spatial resolution or spectral resolution, whether you're in more interested in just getting lots of counts or whether you really need exquisite spectral resolution and you throw out the events that have poor energy reconstruction. And so in that way, we need some data quality or event energy probability distribution that can let the user decide. Um, the grade obviously is a data quality indicator but we need something a little better than that. Um, and fitting some kind of function will help us get that metric. And I just wanna put up these references here because there's obviously been a lot of work before this um, that, uh, that we've used in this, in this work. And I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Eric. That was a very interesting talk. If we have any questions, please add them to the Slack channel or the Q&A. Um, 
I'll take a opportunity to ask you a question about um, all, all of this you're proposing would be done on on board the satellite for the event detection. It wouldn't be because we don't get the electrons because that's too much <laughs> telemetry. Yeah. yeah. Um, for for Chandra, so so I will say for for Asus, um, it, it has led to us understanding, I think, better how how CCDs like Asus work. Uh, we're not sure right now that we actually have any recommendations for uh, applying this to Asus for future missions, however. Um, if we telemeter enough data, if we telemeter like a seven by seven or nine by nine pixel information, then we can do this on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you want to do because the idea is to make this uh, as flexible as possible because one user might just want all of the counts. They really don't care about getting really good spectral resolution as long as they sort of know the energy of an event. Or they might care about the hard band and not the soft band. Um, and so I think, I think you, we need to think about how we can get enough information down to the ground to make uh, the, the entire data set of these future missions valuable, um, especially once it gets archived. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. That's the uh, VFaint setting gives you a larger island uh, that's telemetered exactly. down uh, in, for Chandra. Exactly. That's all the time that we have great questions now. If you have any questions for Eric, please add them to the Slack channel. I'd like to invite our next speaker to start sharing their slides while I introduce them. Our next speaker is Ashkabin Denikar from the University of Michigan. He's going to talk to us about Bayesian X-ray spectral analysis of the symbiotic star RT crew. Go ahead, Ashkabin. Thank you for introductions. And this uh, today I will talk about my recent study of the X-ray spectral analysis of symbiotic star RT crew, which done. Uh, using Bayesian MCMC uh, studies. I did this work in collaboration with Margarita and Jeremy Albino at Center for Astrophysics. <clears throat> Symbiotic SSR are a, a binary SSR which consists of heart uh, accretion core, such as white dwarf and a cool uh, red giants. And typically they have a soft or super soft X-ray emission. However, a few of them, they show uh, hard X-ray emissions such as RT crew. The origin of this hard X-ray emission not well understood. This hard X-ray emission has energy higher than 50 kV, and it has been suggested that probably uh, related to, to massive white dwarf close, close to Chandra's hard limit. So they could be a progenitor for type 1 a supernova. Uh, Arctic crew has a usually uh, it has a very high X-ray variability. And uh, for a study of uh, th this article, uh, we use uh, Chandra high energy uh, transmission skeletons, which collected in uh, 2005. And we use also low energy transmitting skeletons, which collected in 2015. And we separated uh, low, and, uh, low and high states uh, using this hardness ratio diagrams. And by separating these uh, events, we made uh, to different spectrum in lowest set and highest set. Also, we made time average spectrums. And we did it a Bayesian low count X ray spectral analysis using Pipelux CXS. And uh, by fitting Makel and Apex, uh, we found uh, two components, one of them hard X ray component at 10 kV, which previously found in 2007. And we additionally find a soft X-ray components uh, at uh, energy 1.3 in the time average spectrum, which is something new. And it is heavily obscured by uh, high column density, dense materials. And in order to do this fitting, we use a Chow statistics and uh, we simultaneously fit background and source. And by simultaneously fitting background and source and using MCMC base, uh, we produce uh, posterity, posterior uh, probability distributions of best fitting parameters. And as you see here, we find 1.3 kV for uh, the soft components, but it's was heavily absorbed by, by column density of 75 times 10 to the power of 22. And what for a uh, hard thermal component, which is around 10 kV, it has low uh, column densities. And we did similar works uh, thank you for this similar work for low uh, low or hard SA spectrums and uh, we find different components in soft and hard thermal emissions and uh, also we did it for high or soft SA spectrums and we also find different components in 
uh, high estates. And here is a summary of the result for uh, soft thermal component. As you see, it was uh, heavily obscured by column density of 75 uh, times 10, 10 to the power of 22, and this was heavily obscured. But the hard extra components is was around 10 uh, times 10 to the power of 22, the column density. So it's not heavily obscured. So this hard and soft thermal component have been found in other hard X-ray emissions and symbiotics like CH6, uh, 0 0.2 and 0 0.7 and 73, and also an NWC56, and also uh, WS73 and 17. So this is the soft and hard components. It has been found in different uh, <coughs> hard X-ray emitting. As was suggested, this was related to shock fin or unseen jets, uh, which we didn't find in the, which we currently there is no imaging observation article, so we didn't find, we are not able to detect unseen jets. And, and uh, in summary is uh, this uh, article has a large extra variability. And for this study, we separated hard and high states. And in time average, we found uh, two different components, which 10 kV, which previously found. And we additionally found 1.3 kV, which heavily obscured by dense materials. And uh, it needs further study to find the origin of these soft components. And this result is published in Mass Notice for Assumption of Solidity. And here you see, you can look at the archives, uh, uh, the archives uh, preprint of it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ash, for that very enlightening talk and very interesting work, uh, really pu pushing that data to its to its limits and to uh, learning quite a bit from it at the same time. We don't have time for questions. That was a, a good five minute uh, talk on, on RT Crew. Uh, if you have any questions for Ash, do put them into the Slack channel. I wanna thank you all for joining us today on the second day of our uh, workshop. We have another day tomorrow, uh, same time, same Zoom link. I hope to see you then. Thank you all. And thank you to all the speakers today.